So welcome to this week's uh, Holotube seminar. So uh, this week, uh, Daniel Grumiller from Vienna Technical University. He will report on flat space holography in lower dimensions. So we are very happy that you could make it, Daniel, and we are really looking forward to your talk. Yeah, OK, thanks. Thanks for inviting me. Um, I'll start with some general aspects of flat space holography. Then I move to three dimensions and give a brief summary. Uh, but the bulk part of my talk is uh, a detailed account on work in two dimensions that was done uh, two and a half years ago, together with uh, Hamid, Ernan, and Dima in this paper. So here's an outline. So as I said in the beginning, I'll give a general motivation to flat space holography, why we're interested in this in the first place, and also give a very brief summary of uh, some selected results that were obtained in particular in uh, three bulk dimensions. And then for the main part, I'll move to the model that we call CGHS hat model, which I'll explain what this is and why we put the hat here. Um, and then in the final part, I'll discuss the uh, relation of the bulk results to uh, boundary results uh, via an action, a boundary action that we call twisted warped action. And that in many ways is analogous to the uh, famous Schwartz in action that many of you might be familiar with from the uh, Chakif Teitelbaum, such the Fiekitaev correspondence. Uh, this twisted warp action will come from a certain limit of the complex SYK model, which I'll explain. Okay, so let's start with flat space holography. Uh, the main motivation is this rather general question, namely how general is holography? Um, if you look back, the holographic principle was basically motivated by the Bakenstein Hawking entropy, by black hole entropy, the observation that uh, the black hole entropy is one quarter of the area, so it's not extensive, but it would be extensive in one lower dimension. And this principle or this argument is independent from the dimension and also independent from the asymptotic structure. So therefore, if the holographic principle, the arguments that led to it uh, are correct, it should work regardless of whether you're an asymptotically anti the sitter, asymptotically flat space, asymptotically the sitter, or possibly other asymptotics. And note that the first two diagrams suggest already how you could move from anti the sitter to flat space, namely by taking an altruativistic or Carolian limit. So you do an altruativistic boost of this uh, time like line, and then you end up with this uh, null surface, so with uh, scry plus, for instance. Now, the main implementation of holography that we know so far and that has been studied extensively over more than two decades is the ADS-CFT correspondence. So there's this nice uh, uh, popular article by Klevana von Maldasena uh, from which I copied this hyperbolic cow picture that uh, most of you probably have seen. Um, and some questions are then, which of the lessons that we've learned from ADS-CFT are generic lessons about holography? And which of the results that were obtained are specific to either under the sitter or conformal field theory? And more specifically, um, does holography work in asymptotically flat space times? And if so, how does it work? So those are the main questions that I'm interested in here. And for technical simplicity, I'm going to address these questions in three or two bulk dimensions. All right, so here are some approaches to flat space holography. Uh, the first idea is rather straightforward. Uh, you consider flat space holography as a limit of ADS-CFT. So the main idea is you take the large ADS ra radius limit of ADS-CFT. And a nice aspect of this approach, if it works, is that you can exploit the numerous results of ADS-CFT. So you can take the 17,000 papers on ADS-CFT and send the ADS radius to infinity in all of them and then write 17,000 papers in flat space holography. Um, the catch in this procedure is this word only that I put under square quotes. Um, it may not be obvious how to take this limit. It may not exist or it may not be unique. So this is the main issue with this approach. And let me give you some examples. So, Say you start with the locally asymptotically ADS expansion, the usual fifth one gram expansion, um, and rho to infinity is the boundary, the asymptotic boundary. And you take the limit of a large ADS radius, L. So L to infinity means that this factor here goes to one. 
So it means that all factors in this expansion of the same order, and you can just you know, add all of them to a single quantity gamma mu nu. Uh, so this would be the naive uh, L2 infinity limit, but this is not what you usually do in asymptotically flat expansion. So this is not what you get when you consider asymptotically flat space times in bonding gauge. So that limit is not suitable here. A second example on the CFT side, you can also take uh, a naive large L limit of the CFT2 conformal algebra. Uh, for concreteness, I choose uh, two boundary dimensions. So the conformal algebra in two dimensions just given by two copies of the Virasora algebra here explicitly with the Brown and no central charge, um, L over G essentially. And if you take L to infinity, you induce an in Wigner contraction of that algebra. So you have to rescale L by some square root of L factor, uh, then divide by L and then take the limit. And then you end up with a algebra that only has a central term. Um, and this is again, not the algebra that you would like to obtain, or not, at least not the algebra that you obtain from an intrinsic flat space analysis. And it's also not the algebra you would obtain from a Galilean or Carolian limit uh, of the Virasso algebra. So uh, in practice, in many instances, uh, the limit does exist, but how you have to take it, how you have to arrange your variables um, is not unique unless you know already what you want to get. So in practice, it often means that you have to study first intrinsically flat space, and then in retrospect, you understand how you could have taken the limit from ADS or from the CFT side. So we need also some intrinsic way of dealing with flat space holography. And this brings me to the second approach, which uh, I call Carolian holography. And the main idea is to focus on the asymptotic symmetries of SCRI. Um, so the nice aspect of this is that you can exploit uh, the Bondi uh, from the Burg, Metz, and Sachs or Brown and No type of analysis. And you only have to decipher aspects of the dual uh, field theory, which turns out to be a Carolian uh, conformal field theory. Um, and this approach was uh, pursued in numerous papers by Arjun Bakshin collaborators and Glenn Barnich and collaborators. Um, it also has some problems. So the first one is in this way, you get naturally a Carolian CFT at square plus. And you get another one on square minus. So the natural question is, what is their relation? Um, and the second problem, or at least question is, how are these holographic observables that you get using this approach related to asymmetric observables? If you do flat space holography, well, your space time is asymptotically flat. And in asymptotically flat space times, you have a natural set of observables that is not per se holographic, namely standard asymmetric observables. Um, and if additionally, you cook up some holographic dictionary with some holographic observables, it's fair to ask how these holographic observables related to the usual asymmetric observables. And that's not evident in this approach. OK, and uh, another approach is uh, known as celestial holography. So there the idea is to exploit this infrared triangle between soft theorems, BMS symmetries, and memory effects. Um, and this was pursued by Andy Strominger and collaborators in the past uh, almost decade. And some nice aspect of this idea is that uh, it encodes the gravitational S matrix elements as conformal correl correlators on the celestial sphere. Um, and one of the issues is that it's not clear how celestial holography explains uh, the Bekenstein Hawking entropy. This is not evident in this approach. Also, in some sense, it's conceptually a bit unclear how this relates to standard holography, because in some sense, you're doing co dimension two holography because you're uh, formulating your observers in terms of a uh, conformal field theory that lives on a co-dimension two manifold, namely the celestial sphere. Now, a use useful observation that um, may resolve uh, many of the issues of point two and of point three uh, is a recent observation by uh, Laura Donet, Adrian Fiorucci, Yannick Herfrey, Romero Lusiconi, and independently uh, this work by Arjun Bakshin collaborators namely that Carolian and celestial holographies are related to each other. So that means if there's a problem that you cannot address uh, using one of the approaches, you may just translate everything into the other approach and that problem might be absent in that other approach. So for instance, there is a way to account for the uh, black hole entropy using the Carolian holography. So if you can map these two holographic, holographic approaches to each other, then some of the uh, issues can be resolved. Conversely, the issues with uh, relation to S matrix observables uh, 
that you can resolve by mapping Carolian holography to celestial holography because there the relation to S matrix elements is uh, built in from the start. Now, the goals for this talk is to start with a one slide overview of Carolian holography results in three dimensions. So here I'll be rather telegraphic, I mean, very uh, concise. I just present one slide and highlight some of the results, but I'll not discuss them in great detail, although I'm happy to take questions later. And then after having finished with this overview, I'll give a more detailed account where I also uh, get my hands dirty a little bit and, and discuss some technical aspects uh, is, is, is going to be in two dimensions. So I'll, I'll give a detailed review of Carolian holography results in two dimensions. Okay, so let me start with one, my one slide summary of uh, flat space Carolian CFT correspondence in three bulk dimensions. And I'll start with the symmetries. So the symmetries of relevance are the BMS three symmetries and the BMS algebra is uh, provided here. So LN are the so-called super rotations that generate diff S1 and they form a width subalgebra. So like a Virasora algebra, but without central charge. And the MNs are so-called super translations. So they commute with each other. They are angle dependent translation generators. And the commutator with the super rotations is non-trivial. And on the right-hand side looks like a Virasora algebra. And for Einstein gravity, there is indeed a non-trivial central charge. Uh, I call it CM. And it's uh, given in terms of Newton's constant. So that algebra without central extension was first found by Ashtika, Bichig, and Schmidt in 96. And 10 years later, with central extension in this paper by Glenn Barnich and Shofri compare. <coughs> and uh, Arjun uh, realized the relation to uh, Carolian CFTs. So actually in his first paper, he called it still Galilean CFTs, but they are isomorphic to Carolian ones in two dimensions. Uh, and in, in this work with uh, Stefan, we proposed uh, first concrete realization of this correspondence. So concrete uh, field theory dual. All right. So here now some checks and observables that uh, you can do in this context. And all of these checks are ultimately based on the symmetries. So in some sense, they had to work, but it's still, well, not trivial to see how they work precisely and that in fact, they do actually work. So let's focus first on thermal properties. You can do cardiology, by which I mean, you can use methods similar to the ones used by Cardi to derive uh, the asymptotic density of states um, using some contracted version of modular invariants. Uh, you find details in these two papers here. And the result is that on the gravity side, for Einstein gravity, you get, of course, the bekenstein hawking entropy law. And you can just rewrite this in the suggestive way. So the entropy is given by 2 pi times delta L. Delta L is the L naught weight of the state whose entropy uh, you are evaluating. And L naught is uh, the zero mode of the super uh, rotations. And then times the square root of CM over two times delta M and delta M is the M naught eigenvalue. So the corresponding uh, eigenvalue of the super translation zero modes. And these formulas indeed coincide. And the right-hand side is what you would derive uh, on the field theory side. So this is the uh, BMS or Carolian CFT version of the Cardi formula. Okay, another thermal property uh, that uh, we found interesting is that there are Hawking page-like phase transitions in these uh, flat space models. So there's a, a transition between hot flat space and flat space cosmologies with a critical temperature given by essentially the angular velocity of the horizon. Um, so the transition is between um, solutions with the horizon uh, and hot flat space. So if you're at temperatures far above this critical temperature, then um, the dominant settle point is a solution with horizon, hot, uh, uh, sorry, flat space cosmologies. And if you had very low temperatures, then the dominant settle point is just hot flat space. Okay. Um, some of the results above and also below can be generalized to higher spins. I just mentioned this to advertise uh, this high spin generalization. So, Basically, what you generalize is the symmetries. So from instead of BMS three symmetries, you get a W version of the BMS symmetries. Um, and based on this W BMS algebra, you can uh, generalize some of the checks above and also some of the checks below. 
and there's some curious thermodynamics and phase structure uh, that I just mentioned here. Uh, Daniel? Yes, sure. Can I ask a question about the previous slide? Uh, uh, this yeah? how yes, yes, this Hawking page like phase transition, uh, does this critical temperature depend on the gravity theory that you consider? Yes, yes, yes. So, so this depends, of course, on the gravity theory and all the results that I'm presenting here um, for Einstein gravity. So, so if you take instead topologically massive gravity or some other higher derivative theory, uh, then the precise uh, value or perhaps even the very existence of a critical temperature uh, will change. So, mm -hmm. so also the result, yeah, I mean, obviously also the result uh, that uh, the entropy is just one quarter of the area that's also only true in Einstein gravity and not, okay. not, not generally. Mm, thanks. Uh, but the generalization to, for instance, TMG that was done in the same work. So you can find this generalization there. All right. Now, um, another interesting uh, observable on the field theory side is entanglement entropy, which is a useful measure for, uh, well, entanglement. And on the field theory side, you can derive a formal for entanglement entropy that is reminiscent of the result in uh, two-dimensional CFT. And you also use similar techniques like the replica trick and uh, introduction of twist operators. So if you're familiar with how uh, Holtzay, Wittcheck, and Larsen or Cardian Calabrese derived this for a CFT2, then it should be easy to follow our derivation for the uh, Carolian CFT2 case. And the end result of this calculation is this formula. Uh, so the entanglement entropy consists of two parts. If there is a Virasoro central charge present, which is not the case in the uh, dual to Einstein gravity, but it would be present, for instance, in TMG, then you have this first part here, which is like in the Carroll CFT. So you get CL over six, the Virasoro charge divided by six, times the logarithm of the interval length. which is not present in, in relativistic CFTs. Um, and this is always there when you have this non-trivial uh, mixed uh, central charge CM. So the central charge that appeared in the commutator between super translation and super rotations. And this is essentially given by the ratio of uh, the interval lengths. So L2 and L1 are the uh, time and spatial extent of the interval. And this was derived first in this joint work with uh, Wudan Ilbaso, Arjun Bakshi, and uh, Max Riegler. And this was the field theory result, but you can um, derive the same result on the gravity side. And depending on the methods you use, you can either do this in the Chen Simons formulation, in which case you would use Wilson lines. So similar to the way that you can derive entanglement entropy in, well, in spin two or high spin gravity, uh, or you introduce a generalized notion of Ryu Takianagi surfaces, so-called swing surfaces. So the first approach was pursued in this work by Ruder and, and Max, and uh, these other approaches in this later paper. So. All right. Um, the main set of holographic observables that we usually consider are correlation functions because, well, in perturbative quantum field theory, these are just the main observables uh, of interest. Um, so it's also of interest to calculate them holographically and to establish a dictionary. Um, and this is possible at least for selected correlators. So uh, what you can do is in generic uh, Carolian CFTs, you have uh, operators that are analogs of the energy momentum tensor. So you can calculate the endpoint uh, correlators. And it turns out there are uh, BP set-like recursion relations. So in the relativistic CFT case, uh, Belovin, Polikov, and Samologikov showed, you know, there's a universal result for the two-point function. And then by complete induction, you can show that all the higher endpoint functions of the stress tensor correlations are uh, expressible in terms of the two-point function plus uh, well additional terms that you can explicitly determine. And the same is true in this Carolian CFT. So on the field theory side, you get a closed form expression for all the endpoint correlators of this type. Um, and on the gravity side, you can uh, also calculate this endpoint correlators basically using the usual holographic dictionary for two-point correlators. And then uh, we showed that there's an analog complete induction that you can prove for the higher endpoint correlators. And the upshot of this calculation is that uh, the correlators on both sides uh, of the correspondence match precisely. All right. Um, yeah, and 
then there are additional quantum information inspired checks that you can, that you can do. So uh, you can exploit uh, entanglement entropy for other purposes. So one interesting application is to consider quantum energy conditions. Why would you want to do this? Well, the classical energy conditions like the null energy condition, they don't hold uh, generically in quantum theories, even for very reasonable quantum theories and reasonable states. Um, and Busso and, and collaborators introduced half a decade ago a quantum version of this energy condition, the so-called quantum null energy condition, which relates the expectation value of the null projection of the stress tensor to variations of entanglement entropy. And it turns out that in this Carolian CFT case, uh, there's an analog of this uh, convexity condition. So for instance, you can show that two pi times the expectation value of the L part, so the Durasoro part of the uh, energy momentum tensor is bounded from below by certain combination of second variations and first variations of entanglement to be with respect to interval deformations. And the first inequality only applies if the Virasaurus and the charge is non-zero. And the second one applies if the other central charge is non-zero and it involves also second derivatives, although combined spatial and temporal variations of the entangling uh, region. Okay, so there are again these quantum energy conditions even in this Carolian CFDs. And this is the uh, first example of quantum energy conditions in uh, non Lorentzian quantum field theories. And finally, the last check that I want to mention is uh, the chaos bound saturation. So in uh, CFTs that are duals to gravity theories, uh, you expect saturation of the chaos bound. So the Lyapunov exponent uh, is given by two pi times temperature. Um, and it's not completely obvious what to expect in the Carolian case because you might expect different things because you're doing an in a contraction of space with respect to time. So it could happen that lambda just trivially goes to either zero or infinity, but it turns out that it stays actually finite and takes the same value as in the relativistic case. So you can derive this Lyapunov exponent on the gravity side from a shock wave type of calculation similar to the one done by Schenker and Stanford. So using shock waves in flat space cosmologies. And you can also derive uh, this Lyapunov exponent using an analogous uh, derivation on the field theory side. So using the Carolian CFT analog of out of time ordered correlation functions. And there are further checks, which are just uh, briefly mentioned here, like BMS bootstrap and so on. So the upshot of this is there are numerous checks of Carolian flat space holography in three dimensions. Uh, but it's fair to say that uh, nearly all of these checks are entirely based on the symmetries. So in some sense, they're just checks that uh, the symmetries work properly and uh, affect all these observables uh, in essentially the same way as they are affected in the relativistic CFT case. Um, so some of the problems that I mentioned are not yet resolved, in particular, how to relate a field theory at sky plus to a field theory at sky minus, uh, or how to relate this uh, observables uh, in the Carolian CFT to S matrix observables. So if you want to keep being updated on this, my recommendation is to look at one of the various uh, recent talks by Arjun Bakshi for updates and further information. Okay, so that's all I wanted to say about three dimensions. And uh, now I'll move on to uh, one dimension lower and there I'll go more into detail. Okay, so let me start uh, introducing this uh, CGHS hat model. So I'll work now on the gravity side. Uh, here's my one slide summary of two-dimensional dilaton gravity. This is the most general two-dimensional dilaton gravity action. Uh, you can find it in this work with Omer Mosikone and Celine Twickley. Um, so there's a coupling constant, essentially inverse Newton constant. There's a scalar field X, which we call dilaton field. And we define it always by its coupling to the richest scalar. So it's always X times R. And we can always achieve this form by redefining the scalar field. Note that since we're in two dimension, there's no Einstein frame. So you're always in this uh, Jordan frame instead. Um, and then there's an arbitrary potential that defines uh, the model. Uh, and it has two arguments. It depends on the dilaton and on a kinetic term of the dilaton. So some special cases are scale symmetric models. So functions that are homogeneous of degree one, 
uh, in X. Then power counting renormalizable models where this function is, well, some self-interaction potential plus a kinetic potential times the X squared. Then models without kinetic terms where you only have a function V of X. And out of this, uh, a famous special case is the Chakif Teitelbaum model, which featured prominently in the past six years. Um, and this is a particularly simple model where V is linear in X with some parameter lambda. And on shell, the Ricci scalar is just given by this parameter. So it's two lambda. So depending on the sign of lambda, you can obtain um, space times that are locally the sitter or anti the sitter or also flat. Uh, so this is then tailor-made for ADS2 holography. And the model that we are interested in, even though we'll slightly uh, expand on it, uh, is the model by Cullen, Giddings, Harvey, and Strominger, uh, where V is just a constant. So it's minus two lambda. And that means if you vary with respect to X, you find on the Ricci scalar is zero. So this is suitable for flat spatiography because all solutions are locally Ricci flat. So let me now introduce the CGTS hat model. Uh, it's related to the CGTS model in a way that I'll explain on this slide. So this is the bulk action. Again, we have a dilaton field uh, highlighted here in red. We have terms that depend on the metric. We have an auxiliary field Y. So this is the addition as compared to the CGHS model. Uh, this auxiliary field appears just linearly. So it doesn't contribute to the dynamics. Um, then we have a U1 gauge field because it's two dimensional. It also doesn't contribute to the dynamics in any essential way, but there is an associated U1 charge with this potential. Um, and kappa is again the gravitational coupling constant. So on shell, all geometries are locally rich flat, which you see immediately by varying with respect to X. Um, if you vary with respect to Y, you get constant electric field, which you see from these last terms here. And if you vary with respect to mu, you just get dy is equal to zero. So on shell y has to be constant. So the difference to the CGHS model is that the constant that appeared in the CGHS model as a parameter of the action appears here as a constant of motion. And indeed, if you integrate out first a, then you get a functional delta function. And if you solve this for y, you get back the CGHS model. OK, so since all solutions are locally Ricci flat, let's discuss the asymptotics of locally Ricci flat metrics in two dimensions. And for this purpose, I'm going to gauge fix to Eddington Finkelstein coordinates. I mentioned here my usual caveat that it's not obvious that this is possible with proper gauge transformations. And indeed, in general, it's not. So we lose some boundary degrees of freedom by making this choice. But since we still keep interesting boundary degrees of freedom, well, we feel justified in, in making this choice. So it's a bit like choosing brown and no boundary conditions uh, in anti city space. They're not the most general ones, but they're very interesting ones and useful. OK, so demanding richer flatness means that the second gradual derivative of this function has to vanish. So you get a function that is linear in R, uh, and it has one coefficient function that depends on u, p of u, and another one depends on u and is just constant in R. And OK, the factors of two are just from convenience. Um, if P and T are both constant, then you get a killing horizon uh, located at minus T over P. Uh, and this is what I'm going to assume in most of my talk. And then the space time interpretation of the solutions is just a uh, rindless space. So you can estimate already that this CGGS hat model may capture generic features of non-extremal black holes in a way that is reminiscent of how Chakif Teitelbaum gravity uh, features aspects that are generic for nearly extremal black holes. OK, and the boundary conditions we want to impose is that uh, these functions here are unconstrained. So we allow arbitrary fluctuations in not equal to 0. So these are our boundary conditions for the metric. Uh, there's an order R term, order one term, and possibly subleaving terms. And these are state dependent uh, functions appearing here. And if you now solve the equations of motion, it turns out that these boundary condition induce boundary conditions on the dilaton, where the dilaton also is linear in R with coefficients that uh, must be allowed to fluctuate. So x1 and x2 are again functions that are allowed to fluctuate. 
the fluctuations are not independent from P and T, but well, they, they are defined by solving on shared conditions. Okay, so this is our answers for the boundary conditions. Now, the next step is straightforward. We determine the asymptotic killing vectors preserving these boundary conditions. And since this is a student's exercise, let me just give you the result. So this class of metrics is preserved by these asymptotic killing vectors, and they also preserve the asymptotic form of the dilaton. So you see there are two arbitrary functions appearing, um, epsilon of u and it of u. And epsilon of u generates super rotations if you want. So diff S1 or diff of R, depending on what you assume about, uh, well, the u direction. And it of u generates a radial version of super translations. Note that in two dimension, there cannot be super translations in the usual sense because there are no angles at the boundary but uh, there's a radial version of super translations. So you have eta u dr. Um, and it turns out that the metric functions p and t, they transform non-trivially under this asymptotic killing vectors. And the transformation behavior is encouraging um, because this looks a bit like, I mean, p looks a bit like a one current. You have epsilon p prime plus epsilon prime p, although there's this funny looking epsilon double prime term. And t looks a bit like a stress tensor in a CFT. So a bit like a Schwartz and derivative, epsilon t prime plus two epsilon prime t, but there's no epsilon triple prime. And then there are these additional funny eta prime and eta p terms. So we have to discuss what this means, but it's at least promising. Okay, um, so once we have the asymptotic killing vectors, we can determine the Lie bracket algebra and you find uh, an algebra that we call BMS2. So this is the algebra, it's very simple. If you go to Laurent modes, um, you can bring it into the, this rather intuitive form. So the L's are again, uh, well, super rotations, the M's are super translations and L with M don't commute. Um, but note that the, the structure constants are slightly unusual. So you have minus N minus M. So this is not a sign mistake. There's really minus N appearing here. Um, the interpretation is that these are spin zero super translations which is different from the usual spin two super translations that you have in BMS three, for instance. Okay, so we'll just call this BMS two and this algebra can, and in general will have non-trivial central extensions. Now there's an interesting global aspect that I want to touch upon. Uh, it's discussed in much more detail in this recent work by Hamid and Blaja. So let me mention what this issue is. I can redefine my function that generates super translations. So instead of using eta, I introduce sigma and they're related by derivative. So eta is sigma prime. And when I calculate the corresponding generators GN and develop into Laurent modes, I get this algebra and this algebra is now a standard, um, well, if you want warped Virasora algebra without uh, central extensions or a warped width algebra. Uh, so JN is now a spin one current. And the relation to the old super transition generator is very simple. So Jn is n times mn for n is not equal to zero. So this is almost a change of basis, but note that J0 is mapped to zero by this and nothing maps to M0. So there's an issue with zero modes, which should not be surprising because there's also an issue with zero modes in this identification because we're taking one derivative here. And later I'll show you that uh, M0 is interpretable as a winding mode of the Maxwell field. But for now, I'm going to dismiss the winding mode and focus on the warp put algebra because it's a bit simpler to handle than the BMS2 algebra. Okay, so in order to proceed, I'm going to use the gauge theoretic formulation. And for people who are not familiar with this gauge theoretic formulation two dimension, but who are familiar with the John Simons formulation, let me just state in one sentence uh, that this is the two dimension analog of John Simons. So, a so-called Poisson sigma model is the gauge theoretic version of two-dimensional dilaton gravity. Um, one uh, technical complication is that these Poisson sigma models are in general nonlinear gauge theories, so they're not of Young-Mills type. But for our purposes, since we're studying a very simple model, actually a linear but non-abelian gauge theory is sufficient. So both for JT gravity and for the CGHS hat model, you don't need a Poisson sigma model. You can use uh, a simpler version, uh, namely a non-abelian BF action. So this is a non-abelian BF action, or at least the bulk part of the action. You just have some scalar fields B, you have field strength, uh, non-abelian field strength associated with some uh, non-abelian connection A. Uh, 
uh, some bilinear form and some coupling constant. And if you want to have a gravity interpretation, then you should choose your connection one form as follows. So it has a dualized spin connection part times a, a boost generator. Then you have Zweibein times translation generator. And in our case, we also want the Maxwell field uh, with an additional abelian generator set. And the scalar field is chosen similarly and contains the Dilaton field and then additional auxiliary fields. Why? The field Y we already encountered in the CGGS head model. And XA, I'll explain on the next slide what it means. Um, OK, so this is some general aspects of BF models, but we still need to specifically choose a gauge algebra and the bilinear form. And I'll do this on the next slide. So in order to get the CGHS head model, we should choose uh, an algebra that is associated with flat space. So essentially the two-dimensional point career algebra, but there's a slight uh, twist to the story. So we don't quite choose the Poincaré algebra in two dimension, we choose instead the Maxwell algebra, which is a centrally extended version of Poincaré. So uh, P with J translation boosts commute in the usual way into uh, translations, but translations don't commute, they commute up to a central extension set. So this is the generalization uh, of Poincaré. Um, and the reason why we like this additional generator set is because only in its presence, we get a non-degenerate bilinear form. So that's why it's better to have the CGHS hat model and not the CGHS model. And this is our definition of the bilinear form. OK, and if you insert this data into the general BF action, this is what you end up with. So you get XA times this two form. And if you stare at it, you, you recognize this is the torsion two form. So now you understand the meaning of XA. They're just Lagrange multipliers for the torsion constraint. So this is a bit like the. Palatini action, if you want. So if you vary with respect to xa, you get the equation of motion that established the spin connection is torsion free. Then x d omega, this is just dilaton times curvature two form. So that also makes sense. And this is just the volume form times y, which is the potential that we had in the CGHS head model. And the last term is also what we had before, y dA. And indeed, if you integrate out xa and then the spin connection and use the usual relation between zwei and metric, you recover the CGHS head model. So this is indeed the gauge theoretic formulation of this second order action. OK, so now that we know that uh, this gauge theoretic action is equivalent to this one, we can just translate our boundary conditions into the BF formulation and proceed from there. Uh, Daniel? Yes. Uh, may I ask another question? Sure. Uh, can we get this uh, model from reduction of a three-dimensional gravity over a circle? Um, you can get the JT model as a reduction. Um, the CHS model, I'm not sure. Um, I'm not sure. I was thinking that since you have a constant electric field in the background, maybe we need to turn on some rotation on the circle or something like this. Yeah. Um, it's not quite, I think, what you would get from a standard Kaluza Klein reduction of uh, flat space gravity. At least, yeah, I, I, I was not able to make this connection. But yeah, so the short answer is I don't know. Um, mm -hmm. But it's not obvious to me that it's possible because uh, if you compare this with the Kaluza Klein reduction of, say, the BTZ black hole of Einstein gravity to two dimension, then you get. Uh, a generalization of the JT model, the Achukano yes. Ortiz model. Uh, and that has a slightly different structure. So, so I'm not sure you would get this model from dimensional reduction. I would expect some um, cross terms that involve also the Dilaton field X with an additional connection. So mm -hmm. this connection here has more auxiliary nature. It's not, I think, related to the gauge connection you get in typical Kaluza Klein ansatz. But yeah, the short answer is I don't know. Uh, but I expect okay. it to look a bit different than the CGJ set model. Okay, thanks. All right. So um, again, for, for the experts who are familiar with uh, the Chansan formulation of uh, 3D gravity, this should look very familiar. So the ansatz that works very nicely in three dimensions, and in fact also worked nicely for the JT model, um, is this one. So the uh, BF connection A is split into a group element B that is state independent and depends only on the radial coordinate and a 
boundary connection A that only depends on the boundary coordinate U and also has only a lag in the boundary direction. Uh, and this small a contains all the state dependent uh, information. Um, okay, sorry, hold on uh, a second. My daughter's calling me, maybe it's an emergency. Just a second. Hello, Leah? Hello? Okay, yeah, sorry. <laughs> uh, everything seems fine. Um, good. So this group element here um, is chosen in this specific way just to recover ending things to engage. It's nothing profound. If you make a different choice, you get just the same metric in different gauges. But if you make this specific choice, you recover the results that were before. And uh, the boundary connection A is chosen in this way. It's reminiscent of the so called highest weight gauge. Uh, I apologize for this uh, technical slang, but many of you will be familiar with what this means. So we have some part that contains state dependent information, T of U and P of U, but also some part that contains just you know, a numerical factor, which in this case is one. Um, and then, okay, also the uh, uh, similar decomposition works for the scalar field. So this scalar field B is decomposed into group, same group element and the boundary is scalar field X. And this uh, has uh, components in all algebraic uh, parts. So P plus, P minus, J, and Z. And these functions X1 and X0 are the ones that appear in the asymptotic dilaton. Uh, y is this auxiliary field Y, and X plus is determined in terms of all the other quantities. So it's not independent. Okay, and again, T and P are allowed to vary, and this induces variations in all these Xs as well. So one can show that this yields the same metric in dilaton that I've shown to you before. So this recovers the metric results. But there's one more thing we actually need to check, namely, do we reproduce the correct Maxwell field? So the correct Maxwell field should give a constant electric field. That means we should just get the Coulomb potential into the mansion. Into the mansion, Coulomb potential is confining. So you get A is R times du. Um, and now you may have two conflicting expectations. What happens when you act with the BMS2 symmetries on this? On the one hand, since you get an additional condition you have to preserve, you may expect the reduction of the asymptotic symmetries. Not all of them may preserve this. On the other hand, we have additional U1 gauge transformation at our disposal. So you may expect an enhancement of the asymptotic symmetries from this U1. And it turns out that both effects essentially cancel. So the Maxwell field is preserved by a combination of diffuse and gauge transformations, provided the parameter of the gauge transformation sigma is related to the uh, BMS parameter eta in this way, eta is sigma prime. And this is exactly the condition that I showed to you earlier. So that means that there are two different takes how you can interpret this. Either eta has no zero mode, uh, because if sigma is, for instance, periodic, uh, then, well, eta can have no zero mode, or sigma is not single valued, so it's only quasi periodic, and that means you would switch on winding nodes. Um, so at the moment, I'm going to focus on the case where there are no winding modes. So this uh, Wilson loop uh, has vanishing sigma variation, and making this choice leads to the warped width algebra, which is the algebra I discussed before. So I'll stick to this choice and I address generalizations at the very end. Okay. Now, uh, the final piece uh, on the gravity side is to derive uh, the boundary action, the analog of the Schwarzen action. And this works analogous to the JT case. Um, so how does it work conceptually? Well, it turns out if you vary the Euclidean BF action, so now we go to Euclidean signature, um, you find that the first variation is not zero. So you get the bulk equations of motion, this term vanishes, but you also get the boundary term, and this boundary term doesn't vanish for our boundary conditions. So you don't have a well-defined variation principle unless you add an additional boundary term. So this is the goal. You have to cancel this variation here by adding a suitable boundary action. And this boundary action, well, I call it already twisted warped, anticipating the final result, um, is designed in such a way that it cancels uh, this variation here. And we follow the chakif teitelbaum story in the BF formulation. So if you're unfamiliar with this, I refer you to our paper with uh, Ernan and Jakob from 2018, 
but I'm not going to details here. So I just quote the final result. And the final result is that we find this action here. So this is uh, a boundary action. So it's only integrated over the boundary coordinate, which I have renamed as tau. Um, I'm assuming it's periodic with periodicity beta. Beta is the inverse temperature. Uh, the boundary action depends functionally on two fields, H and G. And it has a form that is somewhat reminiscent of the Schwarzen action. But if you look at it a bit more carefully, you see differences to the Schwarzen action. So for instance, there's no H triple prime term. Now, it looks a bit random, but it has a clear uh, geometric or group theoretic interpretation. So let's recall first, what is the uh, algebraic or group theoretic meaning of the Schwarzen action? Um, it is the group action for various or coadjoint orbits. So this action is also the group action for some coadjoint orbits, but the question is for which coadjoint orbits? And the answer is for coadjoint orbits associated with the group that, are, that is related to this algebra here. So this algebra is reminiscent of the Virasora algebra, but it has different co-cycles switched on and off. So there's no Virasora central charge. There's no U1 level, but there is a twist term. So this twist term may be unfamiliar to some of you. Um, it's what you could get in string theory if you have a scalar field with a background charge. And use, usually you tr transform this away by redefining your generator suitably. So this is usually something that is unwanted. But note that here it's impossible to transform this away because the only way that you can eliminate this co-cycle is if the U1 level is non-zero. If the U1 level is zero, there's no way you can eliminate this term. So it's genuinely there, it's a non-trivial co-cycle. And it uh, captures, well, uh, non-trivial features uh, of this algebra and is essentially responsible for this specific form of the uh, boundary action. So under asymptotic symmetries, H and G turn out to transform as boundary scalars under diffuse, and uh, G additionally transforms uh, like a phase field under U1 transformation. So you can interpret H as a time Reparameterization field, the same field that appears in the Schwartz in action, and G is an additional phase field that is there because of uh, the additional U1 that we have. And this twisted warped action somewhat resembles the effective action for the complex SYK. And this is the last point I want to make in my talk. So in the remainder of my talk, I'm going to focus now on the field theory side. So uh, let's move over to the field theory side. Uh, twisted warped action from the complex SYK model. Um, so in order to obtain this, uh, I'll start with the Hamilton analysis of this twisted warped action. So I just show the Hamiltonian action. You can convert the twisted warped action I just showed to you, which has higher derivatives into a first order action using some auxiliary fields. And it's a fairly simple mechanical system. So you have three pairs of canonical variables and this is the Hamiltonian. And well, this is the relation to the original variables. Um, and if you're familiar with the Hamiltonian version of the Schwartz in action, you recognize the similarity. So actually the only difference is the second term here in the Schwartz in case you have P1 squared and in the twisted warp case you have P1, P2. And I guess in retrospect, this makes sense because we are sort of doing a Carolian limit. So it makes sense that this parabolic shape is converted into this degenerate hyperbola. Okay. And the solutions um, have the features that this uh, canonical variable is periodic, but this one is only quasi-periodic. So there's a term that is linear in tau, um, and it's multiplied by an integration constant G1. And this constant G1 uh, is physically important because it features in the on-shell action. So if you evaluate this twisted warp action on-shell, you get something that is non-zero only if G1 is non-zero. Um, and the twisted warp action on-shell is just proportional to G1. So this G1 is important because it determines you the free energy and therefore also the entropy. Okay, and I want to work out now what the entropy is. So if we assume that G1 is independent from the temperature, the entropy is just minus the on-shell action. So the entropy is just given by two pi kappa times G1. And let's check if this makes sense. If we use the result for the dilaton evaluated at the horizon, we find that this is just given by this uh, number G1. So this allows us to express the entropy as two pi kappa times x evaluated at the horizon. And this is the famous walled entropy applied to two-dimensional dilaton gravity. So apparently this assumption here was correct. And actually you can prove that this assumption is correct. Uh, 
by imposing regularity conditions, so basically some holonomic conditions. And this holonomic condition relates the temperature to this uh, state-dependent function P, whereas T is arbitrary. So on shell P is the U1 charge and T is the mass. So that means temperature depends only on the charge, but not on the mass. And the reason why I highlight this is because this leads to a pe peculiar property that is well known for CHS, namely the inverse specific heat at constant charge actually vanishes, meaning that the specific heat goes to infinity for this model. So why is this uh, interesting information? Well, that's a useful property to know if we're interested in the scaling limit from the complex SYK, because the, com the complex SYK model has the specific heat essentially as a coupling constant in front of the action. So knowing that we are aiming for an infinite specific heat limit uh, essentially gives a unique limit that you should take on the complex SYK model. And the short summary of all the stories is that the limit actually works. So uh, yeah, th this is one, my one slide summary of the complex SYK model. For details, I refer to this extensive paper by Gu Kitaev, such different Tano Polsky. Um, so it turns out that the effective action that governs the collective low temperature modes of complex SYK, so like the SYK model, but you don't have Majorana fermions, you have complex fermions instead, um, is given by this action here. It has two parts. It depends on a time repolarization field H and on the phase field G, so the same fields that we have in the CGHS hat model. And this is just to explain the notation. So this braces uh, denote the Schwartz and derivative. N is the number of complex fermions. We're interested in the large N limit. N times gamma is the specific, specific heat at fixed charge. So this is the parameter we want to send to infinity uh, in our limit. K is known as zero temperature compressibility, epsilon spectral asymmetry parameter, and H is the time reparameterization field, which is uh, quasi-periodic, like for the CGGS head model. And G of tau is a phase field, which is periodic in the absence of winding. So again, it has the same features as our phase field G. And again, according to our thermodynamics discussion, we need to limit N gamma to infinity, infinite specific heat. Um, and it turns out that additionally, to make the limit work, we need banishing zero temperature compressibility such that a certain product of K times gamma times some power of N is actually finite. And I spare you the details. I just tell you the main result that in this double scaling limit, the complex SYK action indeed uh, recovers precisely our twisted warped action. So this shows that also on the field theory side, you recover this twisted warped action. So this boundary action that was the link between gravity side and field theory side in the JT SYK correspondence also is the link in this flat space uh, complex SYK correspondence. Okay, and this is the main result. So let me already conclude. So the main three points were complex SYK um, after scaling limit is dual to the CGHS hat model in the uh, large end limit and low temperature limit. And the link is provided by this twisted warp boundary action. So again, this is the boundary action. It depends on uh, uh, time reparameterization field H and on the phase field G, and they interact non-trivially with each other. So in particular, there are these cross terms, G prime, H prime, and G prime, H double prime over H prime. Uh, so this could provide a simple model for flat spacelography. Um, Here's some uh, further work that uh, has appeared in the past couple of years. So uh, Victor Godet and, and uh, Charles Mateau, they found that CGHS hat describes a universal set of uh, near horizon perturbations of generic non-extremal black holes in higher dimensions. So in a similar way that JT captures some generic aspects of nearly extremal black holes, CGHS hat uh, could capture uh, universal features of non-extremal black holes. Uh, one perhaps obvious question to ask is, is there again chaos bound saturation? And this is uh, still a work in progress with uh, uh, these people here. Um, more generally, I sh should say that any question that was addressed in the JT SYK context can be considered uh, in this CGHS head context. So in principle, this provides numerous novel research avenues. Uh, I just haven't followed them very closely, uh, partly due to pandemic and partly due to organizing uh, strings 2022. But I think there's a lot of potential in 
exploiting this flat space holographic correspondence in 2D. And taking one step back and going to the original question on generous holography, um, even beyond flat space and ADS2, I think it could be interesting to consider if one can uniformize some of the results uh, that were obtained to make statements about generic 2D gravity using this uh, Poisson Sigma model formulation. So this is something that we hope to get back to in the future. And uh, as a final statement, let me uh, advertise uh, Strings 2022 in Vienna. So it will take place July 18 to 22 um, in the main building, in the historic building of the University of Vienna. This is the link. Uh, so you can register at this webpage. The early bird registration is still possible till uh, end of May. Uh, so you shouldn't miss it. Um, and yeah, let me stop here. Thank you for attention. And uh, now uh, I'll take questions. Yeah, thank you very much, Daniel, for your really nice talk. And also thanks for organizing the first in-presence string theory meeting uh, after the pandemic. So we are hope this works out. And we're really looking yeah. forward to it. So are there any questions? Yes, Stefan, yeah. please. Yeah. Uh, hi, Daniel. Thanks hi, for the, the talk. Hi, Daniel. So I'm here. <laughs> um, I just have a question about the so the, the phase space you write has these two arbitrary functions that depend on u. Yes. So uh, so I have a question. So would you say that these charges are conserved in some sense, since they seem to be well explicitly dependent on retarded time? Yeah. Um, so. On shell, um, you get always conservation of the Casimir function. It's only if you are sort of off shell that you have uh, non-trivial modes of u in the in the Casimir function. So this is a generic feature of two dimensions, I would say. Um, that well, since co-dimension two is kind of trivial in in two dimensions, there are not uh, any internal modes left with respect to which you can uh, develop your charges at the boundary, other than time. Right, but then you, you, you would say that the charge is just the current. It's true that in 2D, you don't have to integrate the charge over anything. Well, in some sense, yeah. The, in the standard prescription, you don't integrate the charges. You could still integrate it. So it turns out to be convenient often to, inter to, to introduce uh, time average charges. So you just integrate over one Euclidean cycle. And the purpose for doing so is that, well, once you integrate, you can uh, also partially integrate. So you can use techniques that are similar to uh, 3D gravity in this way. Right. But a, a priori, you don't have any integrals. And if you go fully on shell, then the, the, the conserved mass or the conserved Casimir, well, the Casimir function becomes conserved. But we, we want to keep uh, slide off shellness uh, in order to see this uh, mode expansion in you. Right. And, and also, so the reason why you are going to the, the BF formulation, I mean, you could have done everything by just staying in the metric formulation, I guess, or is there? Yes, yes, something? yes. Indeed, that, that's what we did originally. It was just a bit more confusing uh, to us, at least. Uh, what are the precise boundary conditions? Uh, so, so it, well, it involved a lot of, it involved more guesswork, but okay. On the other hand, once we uh, wrote down the BF version of these results, we knew already what the results were. So uh, uh, we had less guesswork to do uh, uh, anyhow. But uh, for deriving the boundary action, I think it's, it's more straightforward using B, the BF formulation because you get some generic results for, for BF theories. So the boundary action is always, uh, given in the for the loosest set of boundary condition by uh, a particle action on the group manifold and the group manifold in question just depends on the gauge group uh, of your BF model. And then once you have this particle action on the group manifold, you can uh, impose your boundary condition. So you, you can do something analog to a Dreamfeld Tokolov reduction. And in this way, you get this Schwarzian type of boundary actions, which in our case leads to this twisted warped action. Yeah. I see. So yeah, so I identify the boundary actions that it's simpler to go in that formulation. Uh... Yes, um, indeed, indeed. And uh, so far, we were not able to generalize this to any two-dimensional Dilaton gravity model that is 
not uh, cannot be formulated as a BF theory. So, so we only know how this works for BF uh, theories, but not for generic gravity theories in two dimensions. And it would be great to, well, <laughs> to do this for generic models, but uh, it seems that currently we still lack the techniques uh, for doing so. Okay. Well, thank you. Thanks again for, for the talk. Sure. Yeah. So are there further questions from the audience? Uh, a quick question about the last slide. Um, so do you expect the chaos bound to actually be saturated for this? Uh, well, given our experience in three dimensions, that, that would be an expectation, yes. So, I mean, naively from, uh, if a shockwave calculation is meaningful, uh, it cannot fail to recover the chaos band because ultimately what you're seeing is uh, infinite blue shift factors from the near horizon region. So, so if, if a shockwave calculation is meaningful, it always will produce chaos bound saturation. Um, but on the field theory side, it's, 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 it's not so obvious yet. So, but the expectation is yes, given that this is what happens in three dimensions when you consider flat spacelography. There, the chaos bound turned out to be saturated. Okay, thanks. Sure. Further questions? So I've got one. Um, namely, uh, so for your algebra, which you showed, you showed that we have one central charge or central germ. Uh, is there a second independent one? And if yes, what do you have to do to your gravity um, ah. formulation to get it? Yes, yeah, so you can have, uh, okay, I, I don't find the algebra anymore, but okay, it's basically this algebra, but you can have up to three co-cycles. Um, and well, if you have all, all three of them switched on, um, you can always eliminate uh, the, the, the twist term if you want. Um, uh, but if you have the, the U1 central charge switched off, then the twist term cannot be eliminated. So if you want the second one uh, and you want to keep the twist term, then the, the main possibility is you have the twist term and you have a virusolar central charge. Um, and in three dimension, we know how to obtain this. So this was done in, in work with, uh, well, in fact, with Stefan and, and Plaja and, and Hamid uh, in a paper that we internally called Rindler Wahnsinn. So, so uh, there you have to switch on, basically, <laughs> you have to switch back uh, the cosmological constant. So, so in an ADS context, but for slightly weird boundary conditions, um, you, you get both a zero-solar central charge and a twist term. So basically, physically, what you do is you do a, a near horizon expansions, you do Rindler space, but you do it in a case where you're not locally flat, but you're locally under the sitter. And in that case, you both get the twist term and the virusolar central charge. Um, and then still many conclusions hold. So, so uh, the, the, in particular, the twist term cannot be limited in this case. So the crucial thing is always um, to have the J's to be genuine super translations, even at the quantum level, if you want. So, so as soon as you make these super translations non-commutative, meaning that you know there's a central extension, so there are no, not actually super translations anymore because they don't mutually commute, at least not all of them. Uh, once you have this, then then you are back on more familiar ground. On on then you get uh, standard warped virusolar algebras. Uh, but if you maintain this property that this is zero, then you always get uh, this twist term that is not that ca that cannot be eliminated, and then you always get this yeah features similar to the ones I discussed here, these twisted warped boundary actions, and uh, yeah. Okay, but thank you. But in but in that case, Daniel, uh, yes. connected to my previous question, that in that case to get this, we in particular we had to integrate over U. We had to pretend that U was a periodic coordinate. That, 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 that is true. Which... That is true. Yes, yes. I mean, here we're doing the same, actually. So, so I mean, in order to go to Euclidean signature, uh, I analytically continued. Uh, I U is equal to tau or T. Um, and then I compactified T. So, so we're doing something similar, like this discrete light con quantization. Um, I mean, OK. We don't have to call it that way, but we are periodically identifying 
a coordinate uh, whose Lorentzian counterpart actually would be a null direction. So it, it, is, uh, it is a slightly unusual uh, feature, but I mean, if you want to have these Fourier modes, you cannot avoid doing this. But note that this algebra also can be represented in Laurent modes. So you don't, you, I mean, you don't have to do this. You don't have to do a compactification. It's just that if you want to have a finite temperature interpretation, uh, then, then you need this compactification and then you need to introduce uh, inverse uh, temperature or periodicity beta. Yeah, but if you do Laurent, if you do, yeah, if you do Laurent extension, then you have to pretend that you is complex and do a contour integral to get and yes. targets. Yes, but, yes, okay. indeed, indeed. Okay. So, Daniel, um, may I ask a question? Sure. Uh, do we have something like KDV type uh, boundary conditions for this CGSS model? Um, uh, so, so by KDV boundary conditions, you mean the story by Ricardo Alfredo? And yeah, yeah, so, I mean, that's in three dimensions, of course, but yes, yes, something similar to that. I guess so. I mean, we haven't tried this, uh, but I guess you could uh, do some similar kind of deformation. Um, so, but yeah, um, my guess is yes, but it. Well, it, it wasn't done, so so I, I okay. can't say for sure. Mm -hmm. Okay. Uh, hi, Daniel. Hi. Um, just a comment on uh, Martin's question. So it is possible to have a um, Hirosoro central term in the two D case also um, uh, if you if you use a more general um, binomial form. Um, uh, which we call the twisted um, CGHS hat mode. Yes. Yeah. Thanks for pointing this out. Mm. And I have also a question. I mean, um, sure. <laughs> um, yeah, it's also related to what Stefan asked. Um, and uh, well, it is true that we find this uh, kind of asymptotic symmetry um, algebra, but is it um, obvious that we should call them charges? I mean, um... Um, well, uh, this is, is a question of nomenclature. I mean, I, I, no, it's not obvious, of course, because you could say there's only one charge because uh, you, you have a U dependent charge, if you want, off shell, and there's only one of them because there, there's no boundary dimension. So, so uh, yeah, but I don't know. It, it, for better or worse, it has become practice to, to refer to these modes as charges in, in, in a 2D context. And also, I mean, I mean for, but because we know from the boundary point of view, the boundary theory uh, obviously has um, uh, um, the number of charges are two or at most four. So, um, so it's a, I mean, the whole symmetry is broken too. Um, 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 I don't know the the two D Maxwell uh, algebra. So so it's not infinite dimensional but charges. Yeah. Okay. So so this but but this is I would say analogous to the breaking of Fiorezoro to SL two in the Schwarzin case, right? Exactly. So 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 what Amit is saying that this Maxwell algebra that I showed previously, I mean I didn't mention this. Um, is, is a bit like the wedge algebra of uh, this infinite dimensional algebra. So it's the subalgebra um, uh, of this bigger algebra that essentially doesn't see this central term. So you see if n is equal to one or n equals equal to zero, this central term here is gone. Uh, so you can find four generators that form a subalgebra and that's how subalgebra turns out to be uh, the, the Maxwell algebra that I showed earlier. And it plays uh, essentially the same role for this uh, twisted warp action as the SL2 algebra did for the Schwarzin action. And it, yeah, also the SL2 algebra has the same role, it's the subalgebra of the Virasor algebra that is blind to the central charge. Right, but then uh, from this point of view, doesn't this feature, I mean, is uh, somehow shared with 3D? Because 3D, you, you also have um, if you consider the boundary two-dimensional boundary theory, uh, 
it turns out from the Cutler Jensen work that you also have the broken symmetry. So also the charges are not um, uh, the whole diffeomorphism, uh, the, the whole mirror. So uh, is, is, is it uh, not the right conclusion? Yeah, I guess you can phrase it this way. Yes, I mean, I'm 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 not against this conclusion. <laughs> yeah. mm -hmm. So, uh, further comments or questions? So that seems to be not the case. Then I stop recording, and now we can ask questions like in private to Daniel and how to register, for example, for strengths. Okay. <laughs>